art. I've written a cycle of poems about a fictional retirement village called the Purples. And uh, the first of them, first of the poems, <clears throat> has the title Right Royal. Somewhere in a city of five millions, enclosed by a web of wires, spun by the insect ESCOM, <laughs> is this built refuge for the elderly. 300 in their seventh, eighth, and ninth decades. Combined, their life experience totals all of three and 20,000 years. Yes. That's more than ancient history. It takes you back far, far beyond the venerable pyramids, gliding feluccas and pharaohs kitted out for heaven in their golden masks. Mm -hmm. When you see them pushing walkers and looking shabby in old shorts or out of fashion dresses, do not dismiss these oldsters as a bunch of has-beens tucked away down nowhere lane. Their village signage says, the purples, a Tyrian tint designed for seniority. Mm. Mm. The next poem in the cycle is Life in the Green. Trees populate the purples here, giving their names to drives and lanes, ash grove, chestnut, beechwood, elm, are in the grid with maple and magnolia. The thirst for vegetation's great because it seems to slake the dryness of old age. In little paths, the flowered bushes bulk and make a refuge for the flitting birds. Dark thrushes run to turn up leaves. One evening, a thick knee startled me, fixed like a totem pole with rigid wings on guard before its scrape of hidden eggs. Mm -hmm. The dead ends too are vegetation friendly, gardenia, laurel, silver tree and rose. Some windfall lemons strew a verdant lawn. My cul-de-sac is newly planned with early ACI along its verge. Each day I say, Olive in Olive Close. <laughs> mm -hmm. The village has its various residents. This is a poem based on an elderly pair. It's titled very simply Old Couple. Theirs is a late life love affair enough to end in marriage. It's not the time to question why a frail old woman and her gray beard beau should have wished to plight <laughs> their truth. No, I know. Around the purples, they delight to roam, chatting incessantly and holding hands. There are some favorite corners where the warring winds don't blow and each declares the other will not want. Their vow has made them fertile, a kind of love child's carried in their hearts to flourish and console them both. He sees her girlhood in a wrinkled smile while she calls blessings on his frosty head. Joseph and Mary, if you can believe, these are their Christian names, I tell no lie. You'd think they both had been to Bethlehem for an appointment with the wise men's star. Now it's the new Jerusalem that waits.
the village, being a garden village, has all kinds of uh, animals, birds, and what have you, insects. This poem is called Village Macho Man. He's used... I'll start again. He's used the winter to recoup his tail, and now he's back inside the garden wall. The laughing doves that crowd the lawn have mauves and greys to mingle with the shrubs, but he's assertive in his black and white. The purples brooks no dogs nor cats, small birds fly straight across the wires to stoop on cedars and the sugary drips provided by the folk deprived of pets. Nearby, the master of fine feathers waits, winging and chirping in a rise and fall. Hither and thither he is on the charge. He sees his image in the window's glass and smashes at it with an angry beak. The avian whirls respectful of his frantic fits. Caught in the grip of his testosterone, he persecutes his dainty wives with bomb drops like a busy drone. Until worn out, he starts to drift, one pintailed wider in the wider air. Other birds which make their presence felt are common starlings, and quite common they are at times. This poem is called History of a Starling. Mr. Rhodes released 19 of us in 1897. My forebears, flying from his cage out into new territory, freed up to do our own thing. I got hitched at the outset. Bouncy speckle spade was my chosen female, arresting in her iridescent plumage, chit-chitting with her saffron beak. We saw this gap, a misplaced brick along a cottage wall. Aha! a spot for our domicile to settle and bring up a brood. We hit the spot like a SWAT team, bouncy scuttered under the insulation. I darted away for a cargo of twigs. No bird could lay down a safer bed. Once inside, we revved up the process. Our eggs were as blue as little planets. When the chicks emerged, they shed their lice like headfuls of dandruff. Mr. Rhodes was an apex raptor, that's for sure. His empty nest with stony porticos still stands upon a ridge of Devil's Peak. We are his adept colonials, looking for Liebensraum. We dream our dreams by gutter, roof tile, and the wind-blown pine. In the village, there is a as is so much the case with many of these villages, there is a warm swimming pool used for therapeutic purposes. This poem is called Thermal. Noisy on their noodles, the aqua class are exercising with a splashy zeal. Half drowned, a pool thermometers afloat to say all good at 34 degrees. The sun drives downward in a wedge of light. I like it when the gladsome gang have gone and quite alone I slide into the flow. 
Fixed underwater are two busy pipes that play their jets upon me when I clasp the rail and press my flesh close by. I dream I am a Khoisan on the felt, eluding all my hunters in a spring among blanched reeds and fainbos buttresses. A soothing current wells up from below, warmed by the crimson mantle of the earth. This poem is about a long life and about a person doing his best to create a garden. It's called The Garden. When I was eight, I told them I must have my own small patch where I could work the earth. They allocated me a fallow strip between the garage and the boundary fence. Some pungent marigolds were my reward. Now that I'm 80, it is time again to find a way to cope with narrowness. A rose whose root is ever in its grave stands on my patio while in their troughs with spaces freaked with jet, the pansies watch a pot of basil, pushful fuchsias, and bay tree fit to weave a poet's crown. My nose seems pressed against a wired wall which cautions danger and electric fence, but I grow climbing plants to ease the pain. A dibble gave a boy his sense of place. Four wordsmiths help to make this old man's space. And you may have spotted from the quotes that the four poets are George Herbert, a rose whose root is ever in its grave. John Milton's pansies freaked with jet, Keats's pot of basil, and Thomas Hardy's pushful fuchsias. The final poem in this cycle I want to read is called Why the Purples? Why, why did the people who built this place call it the Purples? <laughs> How did the village come to get its name? Perhaps the flowers we grow provide the clue. Alliums and asters, heliotropes and lilies of the Nile, status and the morning glories, heavy vine. Some bogan villas too have this, some bogan villas have this tincture, tincture too. Sometimes the solemn hue extends to residence, to fingers and in flesh supporting tired eyes. There are pupura bruises and the twisty veins which work their ways across the landscape of the skin. The deep edged elderly require no tattoo. And then there is the color of the mind here where the third age verges on the fourth we are like comets dragging tales of memory. There's often something somber in recall. Abide with me, perhaps, has cause to see us through. I'd now like to move to reading a few poems um, um, attributed to Tom Southcross. Quite a number of these have had some success in the Abbob Poetry Project and can be uh, read in the, the Abbob Library. Tom Southcross's Mantra. In 20 years, I made my way 
from ovum to a man, then danced my path for 20 more and lived with much elan. From 40 on the balance tipped as time depressed the scale. At first the weights were dust mote light. I thought I'd never fail. Since 60, it has been a web in which I'm often caught. While I've a mind, I'll focus it upon the whole of naught. I'm ready for the banyan tree, away from this and that. I'm ready for the banyan tree. Goodbye to this and that. Quite a part of a lot of our lives has been the McGregor Poetry Festival. And people who go there will remember the Chapel of the Little Way, uh, which is in the Temenos Retreat Center. Um, this is a, and in that uh, chapel, there's a most interesting icon uh, <clears throat> painted by a man called Richard Maidwell. There is a garden refuge here, half hidden by bright green, in which Gautama's pictured with the gentle Nazarene. They stand together eye to eye, bare feet upon good ground, and speak their messages of love without a single sound. The hands of both are reaching out, suggesting an embrace the six-armed cross and dharma wheel, each blazoned in its place. Two offspring of the single all, they chew on heavenly bread and drink the crystal water that revives hopes once thought dead. The patient painter shows the pair have suffered a sea change depicting their full fathom five with colors rich and strange. This is one of the uh, last activities of um, the Red Wheelbarrow. We're so very near to Christmas now. I thought I'd pick out um, three uh, poems by Tom Southcross that relate to uh, this time of year. Uh, the first is called Two Visitations. When Zeus desired Leda, he approached her as a swan and drove her naked to a creek to work his will upon. Jachwi was more tender with Mary he loved well. To know her will, he sent ahead the gracious Gabriel. Was her assent not needful to what he wished to bring? His close conjoinment with her flesh in a great quickening? Their child would be a testament to this momentous blend. No Dioscuri hatchlings. You remember how uh, the story goes that Castor and Pollux emerged from an egg which Leda produced after her encounter with the god. No Dioscuri hatchlings, but our planet's gentle friend. Then there's the period between that moment of conception and the birth, nine months or so. That is the theme of this poem, Symbiosis. For all of nine months, he was hers to grow, deep in her womb world, no other male would know. Guarded by her gut, nourished through her cord, her close encounter 
with the living Lord. And then the third uh, Tom Southcross poem in this little triptych is the birthday itself, Noel. This young girl, she was foremost among the souls who love. She showed her whole obedience to wishes from above. There was a latent joyfulness, one shepherd thrilling night, when hidden in a darkened space, she gave birth to the light. His eyes fixed on his mother's eyes, he smiled on her to bless. It took three star-struck magi to find their strange address. I'd like to finish my reading with two poems that appeared in the most recent um, McGregor Poetry Festival anthology called Touching the Wild. The first is about a person who was extremely supportive of and interested in uh, poetry um, um, gatherings like Off the Wall and the Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, her name was Winnie Thompson. She, she died not so long ago. And um, the title of this poem is Coeur Veillant, Braveheart. I've known you these many years, a strong built downright lady with your books, your cats, and your holy church about which you were ever matter of fact. You taught generations of schoolgirls the art of the French language and spoke like an insider when you quoted Rimbaud or Baudelaire, the ambiance became Parisienne. Few seem to know the details of your inner world, though you were much concerned with nuances. What your body did show was time's attrition. We are all up there where the dying is. You've done that now, have prayed and gone. Your life was handled with aplomb. And then finally, Tough Love, a poem that <coughs> takes one back in imagination to <coughs> the early world of the Khoisan. Tough Love. A ballad of a sun hunting party. Strange eminence, eminence, to us you are giraffe upon the plain, and we are driven by our need to bring you down in pain. We bend our thonged bows silently in thorn trees where we hide. Our arrows of exigency stick in your trembling side. Immediately you slope away and we must track your spur. We make our way across the earth, drawn by your strength's allure. We do not dare to come up close to harm you on this day, but patient poison finds you out and drains your life away. At length we reach you on the felt, spread eagled in the dust, your terrified and lustrous eye is fading as it must. 
Our food's your brain and marrow raw, our drink your body's blood. All these and more you give to us, great animal, you're good. We undulate our dance of love around the leaping flame and ululate with wildest thanks in honor of your name. Above our heads are dots of light which twinkle from afar. We trace your image in the night where all the star beasts are. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Oh dear. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, that's good. I'm now. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you. That was a, a gorgeous reading, Jeff and I. I'm always amazed at the. I'm always amazed at how different the different voices are. Um, you can how different they are from each other and how you mm. give how you give life to them all, how you make them all sing. Thank you very much. Would you like to would anyone would everyone unmute and give Jeff a round of applause? I think I'm unmuted. Yeah. Can you, <laughs> okay, you can do it like that as well. You can do it virtually as well. Um I don't know. Um Lisa said she might be in the room uh, by now, otherwise... Um, Lisa's not yet here. Um, could I then ask you, Mignon, to, um, to, uh, to call people who um, have raised their hands to um, ask a question? I will do so. Jacques raised in hand. Uh, mm -hmm. At this point, Jacques, I think you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm fascinated by the voice of Tom Southcross. Yes. <laughs> um, because he he seems to have a particular creed, but he's also it's a very broad it's a very broad church obviously that he that he um that he speaks for that he speaks from and i wonder for instance um i assume it's not a coincidence that his name is tom that he's he's he's, he's named after one of your favorite poets and mine hardy but also after yeah. the after the champion of 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 doubt and of 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 faith, I wondered if you wanted to say something about that. I assume it's not a coincidence. Yeah, I think that's true. I think um, there are, in fact, some <clears throat> poems. Um, there are some of Tom Southcross's poems where. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a chest. There are some South Cross poems where he actually identifies with and has conversations with uh, the um, the um, figure who's known as Doubting Thomas. Oh and, yes, uh, and, and and sort of shares um, sh shares some of that of that mm. guy's dilemmas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and sort of and, and sort of admits admits to that. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't dare to to tell you what to do. But if you wanted to read one, one of one or two of those in the open mic, you're welcome. Otherwise, we'll have to have you back and soon. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. The uh, the Tom Southcross poems which I read this evening were very selective. There's there's quite a lot of 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 breadth and complication to them, really. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of the one for, for St. Francis. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Love that one. One oh, sad yeah. thing we've discovered about St. Francis mm -hmm. was that uh, you may remember that um, he came into conflict with his father when his father demanded that he hand back all the stuff or the, the profit that he'd made from stuff that he had, uh, of his father's stuff that he had sold and then given away. And um, Francis, uh, there was a whole chadunta where Francis divested himself of all his possessions, including his clothes, and was stark naked. And um, from that time on, he never ever spoke to his father again. Or well, his father never spoke. Or his father never. There was no communication between them, which seemed a sad thing that uh, that his closeness to the Christ figure and the heavenly Father should have uh, supplanted any dealings that he was then to have with the guy who'd actually begotten him. There is a bit of a there is a bit of an issue there. I think, yeah. Well, and he didn't live very long, you know. I mean, one. No, no. I mean, the uh, the lifestyle was such that there wasn't much chance of forging a very long life. Any other questions? Um, I mean, I think an obvious one probably is. Well, are you going to publish? I think Ed has raised his hand, so that can be next. Good, good, good. Hey, Jacques, I'm, I'm also happy for you to complete that thought, that question. Thanks, Vinyan. I just wanted to know whether you, is there any hope of us seeing poems by South Cross package and eyeball in print soon? Well, one hopes so. I do hope some one of these days we might see that. <laughs> uh, the South Cross poems, quite a number of them are in the Avbob library. So actually, if one if if anyone is interested in seeing more of them, you just have to go into the Avbob library, um, key in my name, and then you get the um the different years and if you look at 2022 and sort of go back a few years to about 2019 2020 you would be able to see quite a few of them yeah thank you we'll see that jeff i'm i'm always amazed by the, the humor in your poems it's it's always gentle and but it, it, it's just like a ripple and, and a current it's always it's always present um Jacques question was actually my question um but it's great that you asked it Jacques uh, um I yeah um and, and the musicality in your poems is always always there um th there was a line in in I think it was the poem um about the garden um that has stayed with me and that was uh to find a way to cope with narrowness mm -hmm. um I, I was wondering thinking how that speaks to to some of the poems you selected um I, I don't know if you want to say more about that or if that's just a little thesis in my head a mini jeff thesis that's <laughs> so, yeah there's a very yeah. perceptive uh of you, I think, Ed, to isolate that line because it sort of tells me something about you know, I, I suppose one always works imaginatively within a certain kind of scenario and I think that might be one of the um, one of the features, one of the challenges of of, of a more recent scenario that I've been coping with. Yeah. Yeah. 
I suppose in a way it's inevitable there is always that the imagination sort of stretches out towards something that it might wish to embrace, which um, transcends the immediate kind of environment in which one finds oneself. But sometimes this issue can seem more acute than at other times. Yeah. Hmm. Does that help at all? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Jack, there don't seem to be any other um, raised hands or questions. Um, Should well, we take a break? Yeah, in that case, I think we can take a break for five minutes. Um, and then we can come back and... Uh,